very much, Yanni. Do folks keep Proverbs 1 um, open? And our question really this morning, and the question for the rest of our summer is, do you want to be wise or do you want to be foolish? Do you want to do life well or do you want to do life badly? Do you want to make a success out of life or actually do you want to be a failure? I don't know whether you can relate to this, but there are some people, aren't there, who make life look just effortless. Sure, difficulties come because nobody is immune from the trials of life, but they just seem to navigate through this world with ease. They do life Well, but then by contrast, there are other people, and if there is an obstacle to trip over, they'll trip over it. And if there's a way to make something look difficult and complicated, they'll make it look difficult and complicated. And if there is an error of judgment to be made, they will make it. And they just seem to make life look just really exhausting and really hard work. And the question we're asking really this morning, this whole summer, is how do you explain the difference? Or to put it this way, I don't know if you can relate to this, but everything in life, doesn't it, comes with an instruction booklet. So you buy a kettle, big fat instruction booklet. Here's the weird thing. You don't get an instruction booklet with a human being. So looking at some of the parents in the room, um, Sid and Bryony down here, no doubt when Gracie and Nathaniel were born, you were hoping that they would come with a manual. But you waited in vain, and that is quite strange, because if you need a user guide with a tin opener, how much more with a human being? But the claim this morning, the claim this summer, is that the manufacturer hasn't stuffed up, but rather he has uh, sent a set of instructions in advance, and it's called the Book of Proverbs. God's user manual, if you like, for doing life well. Now, if you have a look at page three of the service sheets, uh, you'll see just quite a rough outline for how this book of Proverbs kind of works. Most of this book over the summer is going to be a whole bunch of pithy one-liners, a bit like this, better a dish of vegetables with love than a fattened calf with hatred. Okay, just think about that. Uh, Put your outdoor work in order and get your fields ready. After that, build your house. A gentle answer turns away wrath. A harsh word stirs up anger. Most of the book is going to be pithy one-liners like that. They, they tease you. They draw you in. But then the first little part of the book, chapters 1 to 9, and the last little part of the book, chapters 30 to 31, give us, if you like, the frame of understanding. They help us to read the pithy one-liners And they give us the motivation for living this way. And all we're going to do this morning, just week one, is just have a little look at this frame of understanding as a way, if you like, of whetting the appetite and setting up where we're going, practical wisdom over the rest of the summer. So hopefully you'll see three things this morning. Here's the first one. Wisdom. What is it for? And if you have a look at the first few verses again of chapter one, Uh, They read, if you like, um, I guess a bit like the blurb on the back of a book cover. They tell you what the book of Proverbs is going to do for you this summer. So just have a look at some of the words here. Okay, wisdom, instruction, understanding, insight, prudence, rightness, justice, fairness, equity, Prudence again, knowledge, discretion, discernment, guidance. Isn't that something you all want? Isn't some of this something that we all want for our lives? So insight, the ability just to see below the surface, to see clearly in every situation. Prudence, not a reference to Gordon Brown's old economic policies, but just being streetwise. Justice, fairness, equity, rightness. Doing relationships in our world well. Discernment, guidance. Always knowing the best decision to make in every situation. Advice for the future. To put it really simply, the aim of Proverbs, better decision making. 
Because I don't know about you, but it's not often that I hear people asking for prayer about matters of guidance where there's a really clear sense of right and wrong, matters of morality. So when was the last time in your uh, Bible study group, in your home group, somebody at the end, prayer requests, please could you pray for me? I'm in a bit of financial trouble at the moment and I'm trying to work out whether I should fiddle my tax returns next year. I mean, maybe it's just my group. But generally, they're not the kind of prayer requests I hear. Please could I have guidance for matters of clarity on things that are just obviously right and wrong. That's not what I hear. But rather, what I hear people ask for prayer for is for matters of wisdom. Or to put it another way, I reckon, I reckon wisdom's the most common thing we pray for. What do you make of that? Um, I hear us pray for that in pretty much all of our prayers on a Sunday morning for our leaders. We pray that for all, in all of our committee meetings here as a church. I think it's probably the most common thing I pray for myself as an individual, for wisdom. And the reason for that is the way that God's guidance works. So have a look at the screens here. God's guidance, I want to suggest, comes not as a bullseye, but as a ballpark. So when it comes to the big decisions of life, uh, career, work, where to live, relationships, God's guidance doesn't come with a phone number or, um, or a photograph or an address. Here is the postcode on page 55 of where you should live. God's guidance doesn't come as a bullseye. And just by the by, I think it's worth saying that we have far more freedom than we probably think we have. God's guidance doesn't come as a bullseye. At the same time, there are certain decisions in life that are kind of um, inappropriate and off limits for a Christian believer. So God hasn't left it so open that any career or any relationship is appropriate. So for example, he says, marry someone He's not going to compromise your devotion to me. Not that he can't work through situations like that or show grace in situations like that. But that's his advice. Or he says probably don't be a hitman or a human trafficker. His guidance comes not as a bullseye, phone number, postcode, address, photo description, but it comes as a ballpark. And that is why we need the book of Proverbs. Because he set things up, so you've got freedom, you've got decisions to make. He's narrowed it down a bit, because he's revealed his moral will, his likes and dislikes, but he's not narrowed it down so much that you just have one decision to make. And so sometimes in life, you've got choices. And sometimes you have to choose between two perfectly good options. And for that, you need wisdom. And for that, you need the book of Proverbs. So next seven weeks, why not block out the series and why not see if this book of the Bible doesn't help us to be better decision makers in life? God's concern is not necessarily to give us all the answers, but to give us the means we need, the tools we need for making good decisions. So wisdom, what's it for? Doing life well, being good decision makers. Where does it begin? Well, most important bit of wisdom in the whole book is verse 7. Um, And in many ways, verse 7, if you want to uh, boil the whole book down to one sentence, here it is. In fact, the fear of the Lord, it's such a big deal in the book of Proverbs. It doesn't just come at the start, it comes at the end. And this little phrase, the fear of the Lord, beginning of wisdom, comes again and again and again. Here is the foundational principle for doing life well. And I want to suggest this is quite a big surprise. Because I think most people would say the opposite of this. Most people would say actually the secret to doing life well is not fearing the Lord, but leaving him behind. So Immanuel Kant's um, Enlightenment, uh, he wrote the famous essay, What is Enlightenment? answers the question with a motto, dare to be wise, sounds a lot like the book of Proverbs, but of course for Kant, 
Wisdom comes not from fearing the Lord, but by growing up and by leaving him behind. Now, at this point, I think it's really important to say what we're not saying Because we are not saying, just because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, that people who don't fear the Lord are incapable of wisdom. So there is such a thing as just general revelation, God's common grace, the ordered world that God has given us that it's possible to observe and to make sense of. So take one of those uh, proverbs that we looked at earlier. Put your outdoor work in order and get your fields ready. After that, build your house. You don't have to be a Christian to realise that it might be a good idea to sort out your external income stream before you invest in property. Yeah, there is just such a thing as observing the world and um, coming to that kind of conclusion. But do you see, the the, the claim of 1 verse 7 is that that isn't a true wisdom. It's It's a borrowed wisdom because it relies on the fact that there is a God who is there who made the world in an ordered way. So just take, for example, modern science. So the only reason why modern science exploded into existence was because people like Newton, Kepler, Galileo believed in a God of order. Okay, they thought that at the heart of the universe was a rational mind, a lawgiver, and therefore they thought it was possible to study the laws of nature. You might say that science was birthed by Christianity, but then by contrast, other cultures that had a a different worldview, multiple deities, a much more random, chaotic view of the world, well, they didn't see anything like the same progress Um, in terms of scientific discovery. And what we're saying is that wisdom is the same as that, but just in the arena of of relationships and morality. Does this make sense? So science discerns order physically, materially. Wisdom discerns order relationally, morally. But the only reason why those two things are possible is because there is a God who is there who makes the world in an ordered way. And so what is the beginning of wisdom? Well, pretty obviously it's to acknowledge him, the fear of the Lord. But before we move on, let's just push this one step further. What does it mean to fear the Lord? And uh, we might know what that might mean in other places in the Bible. What does it mean in the book of Proverbs? Well, just a couple of a couple of references that I found helpful in this introductory section. Do you want to come with me to chapter 3 and verse 5? Uh, here's where we started our service. So 3 verse 5, this is another reference to fearing the Lord. 3 verse 5. Okay, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. He will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. What does it mean to fear the Lord? Well, not to be wise in your own eyes. And that is quite a humbling thing to say, isn't it, in a place like Oakwood. What is the first step of wisdom? Well, to come to him in humility and to actually, on my own, I'm going to make a mess out of life. I am finite. My knowledge has edges. My reason is limited. I'm finite. I'm I'm fallen. I need to learn. I need you to instruct me. We often talk about salvation by grace and not by works. So heaven, not as something we earn, but as a gift. But can you see that wisdom is also grace and not by works? Are you, are you willing to humble yourself this summer? Are you willing to be corrected? Are you willing to acknowledge you need to be taught by him? You need instruction. Do we have the humility to do that? And that takes us to the second thing about fearing the Lord. And I think as well as um, involving humility, the other big thing in this opening section is that it also involves a little bit of effort and hard work. So come with me now to the start of chapter 2. Let me just read from verse 2. So if you turn your ear to wisdom 
and apply your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight, and if you cry out loud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver, and if you search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. So same idea. Wisdom comes from God. You've got to be humble. You've got to be instructed. But do you see as well, you've got to be willing to cry out. You've got to be willing to search. You've got to want to look for this stuff. And in many ways, I think that takes us to the type of literature in this book, because this is not a do this, don't do this kind of book. This is not thou shalt, thou shalt not. Wisdom teases you. Wisdom draws you in. You've got to swim around in wisdom's waters. It involves a bit of thinking. It involves a little bit of hard work. So again, take another one of those proverbs we mentioned earlier. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So a few years ago, I had probably my, my shocking worst driving moment ever just not concentrating at a roundabout and pulled out in front of a cyclist. Now, the cyclist was fine, but understandably was pretty angry. And we stopped, and the cyclist was swearing at me and wanted to fight and wanted to hit me. How do you react in that kind of situation? And the writer says, well, a gentle answer turns away wrath. A harsh word stirs up anger. The writer says, have you noticed that when you respond in kind, that just raises the temperature of the situation. But when you give a gentle answer, that lowers the temperature. And the writer says, well, just think about that. Does that make sense of our world? Is, is that a sensible way to think about life? And so I wonder if I'm allowed just to challenge you this summer Um, Am I allowed to challenge you to read the book of Proverbs over the next seven weeks? I don't think it's enough just to come on a Sunday, a bit of passive listening. This is a book that you've got to reflect on. You've got to do some sort of thinking. You've got to do a little bit of hard work. You've got to enter the intrigue. Would you be willing, next few weeks, to read the book of Proverbs uh, alongside what we're doing on a Sunday morning? So there's the first thing. Wisdom, what's it for? Doing life well, making good decisions, don't we long for that? There's the second thing, where does it begin? You've got to acknowledge the Lord. Wisdom is only possible because of him. It involves a bit of humility and it involves a bit of hard work. And then finally, just really kind of pretty briefly as we finish, who's it for? And on one level, I think this is quite straightforward. Just have a look again at chapter one. So come with me to chapter one. And on the one hand, can you see verse four? Um, wisdom is for the simple. So it's for the one who maybe needs to learn the fear of the Lord for the first time. Uh, The one who needs to come in humility and say, actually, do you know what? I have made a mess of life. I've spent my life walking in the wrong direction, ignoring you, rejecting you, but now I want to turn to you. I want to trust you. I want to receive your forgiveness. And I want to learn the fear of the Lord. And this book is for that person. So maybe you're here this morning as someone investigating the Christian faith. This is a book for you. But did you notice also, verse 5, um, it's also a book for the, um, the wise? In other words, it's for those who have already made those first few baby steps in the Christian life. But verse 5, who want to add to their learning. So it's for everyone. But as well as being for everyone, I want to argue, last few minutes, that it's also a book for one particular person, and not just any old person, but the heir of King David. So just track this through with me. I think this is, this is exciting. So have a look at verse 1. Do you see who wrote the Proverbs? Okay, not just some random wise person, but Solomon, who was... David's son, the line of promise to the coming Messiah. Uh, Then in verse 8, who is this wisdom addressed to? Well, it's not just addressed to any old person, but it's addressed, can you see specifically, to the son of Solomon? 
the heir of David, the one who's not just going to copy Solomon's wisdom, but also occupy his office, the Messiah. Um, add to that, and I, I found this quite profound when I um, read this the other day, but add to that the fact that the arch rival to wisdom, it's something we'll see again and again in these first few weeks, the arch rival to wisdom in the book of Proverbs Does anyone know it's the adulterous woman? Which, if you're a Bible reader, okay, is so evocative, isn't it, of Solomon's undoing and how everything went wrong for Solomon. So, in other words, um, where Solomon failed, the adulterous woman, this son of Solomon, this heir of David, this one in the line of promise, well, he's going to succeed, Then in verse 3, you get these three key virtues. So you get um, justice, um, rightness, fairness. Again, if you're a Bible reader, they are the three words that are always used in the history books to summarize the reign of the kings, Solomon, David, the line of promise. And then finally, these same words are so often used in the Old Testament's most vivid promises about the coming Messiah. So here's Isaiah 11, for example, and it talks about wisdom, talks about the fear of the Lord, it talks about justice and righteousness and fairness, all in the context of looking forward to this great king who's going to come, be the rescuer, the saviour, and the king that we all need. And so this book of Proverbs, isn't this exciting, as well as being a book for everyone, is in particular a book that points to one specific person, this heir of David, this son of Solomon, this one in the line of promise who is going to emulate Solomon's successes but avoid his failures, And this one whose reign is going to be defined by the fear of the Lord. And of course, that means that this summer, this book of Proverbs is going to very excitingly take us straight to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Page three of the service sheet, here's what Jesus said. He said, the the queen of the south um, came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. People came from the whole world to listen to Solomon's wisdom, this book of Proverbs. They didn't just have to uh, walk down the road to St. Thomas's. They uh, traveled across the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. Uh, But Jesus says, now, something greater than Solomon is here. So in Jesus' coming, the, uh, the Messiah, the heir of David has arrived But the big claim this summer is that the book of Proverbs saw him coming. Now, next week, we're going to turn to lots of practical aspects of wisdom, of living, um, all different areas of life we're going to think about over the summer. But I hope that's just helpful, whetting the appetite, uh, teeing up the summer, getting excited, getting us excited for what lies ahead. Shall we have a moment of quiet? Let Let me pray just as we pause and pick up things again next week. Let's pray. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Father, we long to live lives of success and not failure. We long to be wise and not fools. We long to do life well. Father, please would you lead us this summer. Please would you teach us to be good decision makers in every situation. Praise you for wisdom, for the instruction manual of the manufacturer, the creator for us. And please this summer, would you get us more and more excited by the Lord Jesus, the one in whom all wisdom, all treasure is found. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, we come now to the Lord's Supper. And of course, as we 